Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Che Rao. I'm the Director of Communications here at the School of Public Affairs at American University. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today for Trump versus Twitter oversight or overreach. Um, this is one of uh, the first uh, very topical events that we're doing. I appreciate everybody taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, I'm here with Chris Edelson, who's the Assistant Professor of Government um, at the School of Public Affairs. And Chris, this is really uh, something that is roiling sort of the, the public discourse right now. Can you just give us a little bit of a background on, the, um, on this executive order that Trump signed on Thursday? It sure is. This is a big deal. And I'm glad to be talking about this and appreciate questions people have. So what happened was last week, the president, as we know he is wont to do, uh, this is something he does a lot, uh, tweeted on Twitter um, about the election. And he said, I think it was two tweets, where he said, I'm paraphrasing, that there would be, if there was mail-in voting, people, of course, with the coronavirus pandemic are concerned about voting in person. And he said, if there's mail-in voting, it will be fraudulent. So what Twitter did in response was to simply put uh, some information. They put a little flag. They didn't delete the tweets or uh, prohibit people from seeing them, but what they did is put a, a little flag which said, uh, get the facts. I think there's an exclamation point and a link. And the link took you to an article from CNN, I think it was, and some information that Twitter compiled just to tell people that there's not evidence actually that mail-in voting leads to fraud. A lot of Republican governors actually support this too. It's a kind of reasonable public health measure given what's going on. So the president's reaction was to issue this executive order. And it's a really extraordinary executive order for at least two reasons, both of which are important, one of which may not seem that important. But one reason that it's extraordinary is a very strange tone. In the executive order, the president uh, described uh, Russia's attack on the 2016 election as a hoax. That's strange. I mean, the national security community in the United States has said it wasn't a hoax. Russia did attack the election and wanted the president to win. Um, the Mueller report reached the same conclusion. So that was strange. Um, more relevant for our purpose, our purposes, is that the executive order made clear that the president wants to take away legal protections for Twitter and other social media platforms. There's a law, the 1996 uh, Communications Decency Act, and Section 230 of that law provides protections for Twitter and other social media platforms. Basically, what it says is if you, social media platform, post comments from people who are on the website, you can't be held liable. You can't be sued for what they say. And you're also allowed to moderate those comments. You can, for instance, like Twitter put this information about the president's tweets on mail-in voting. And you can't be sued for that either. Donald Trump, in his executive order, said, I'm paraphrasing. This is a pretty close paraphrase. He said, it, I think I have a note on this. Uh, yes, he said, it is, the, it is the policy of the United States that social media platforms should not have these legal protections. And then he described in the executive order some actions that could be taken to, un to weaken, remove, take away these legal protections. Um, some people responded to this by saying, well, the president can't really do this. He doesn't have the legal authority. That's true. Uh, an executive order cannot change a law. The Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is a law. Congress could change it with the president. The president can't do it alone. But to me, what's most important about these actions is it's straight out of the authoritarian playbook that authoritarians like uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Vladimir Putin in Russia, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey have used. What I mean by that, an authoritarian is somebody who uh, rejects constitutional democracy, who doesn't like the idea of the rule of law, of limits on power, of individual rights, of criticism of their actions, or of free and fair elections. They want power and they want to hold power without limits from other people. Um, authoritarians clamp down on media because they see it as a threat. They don't want people criticizing them. Putin did this in Russia, Chavez did it in Venezuela, Erdogan in Turkey. And I think what Trump's executive order does is it sends a clear message to social media platforms, watch out, I will come after you. And what I'm concerned about is that whether or not this is legally enforceable, they will get the message and they will back off. So then can you put it into the context of his, the, his presidency as a whole? I mean. You've, you've studied presidential power and authoritarian 
authoritarian threats. Um, what does this say about the tension that Trump's presidency brings towards what's happening right now and the tension within the constitutional democracy that we have sort of in place? Yes, of course, it's a very tense moment for the country to put it mildly. We are going through the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we just all saw on video uh, a yet another African-American man killed by police on video as other officers watched and as onlookers told the police officers and Mr. Floyd did as well, that he was being killed. Mm. And of course, there are protests in reaction to this. It's, it's a really difficult time for the country. Authoritarians see that as an opportunity. And Donald Trump's entire presidency and his campaign in 2016 has been marked by clear authoritarian warning signs. What I mean by that, again, an authoritarian, by the way, sometimes this term is confusing. I'm not saying Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or Benito Mussolini. Those are totalitarians. That's a specific type of authoritarian. What I mean is he's somebody more in the mold of like a Victor Orban in Hungary, somebody who thinks I should have power and other people shouldn't be able to limit that power and I should be able to stay in power um, by tilting the rules in my favor. Um, they reject the idea of free and fair elections. They, the president has famously said both in 2016 and more recently that he would not necessarily accept election results where he loses. Um, and they don't accept criticism. Uh, so this is a president who is who rejects the principles of constitutional democracy, the rule of law, free and fair elections, individual rights. And he's done a number of things to advance those authoritarian goals. Um, there's, there's a good book called How Democracies Die by two political scientists, uh, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zablot, and they describe a test uh, for warning signs, what would be authoritarians do, and the, Donald Trump met all of that test. And then they, that's when someone's seeking power. And then they have a, they use a soccer analogy to describe how authoritarians try to consolidate power in their, when they're in office. The soccer analogy works in three ways. This is based on their research of authoritarians around the world. One thing that's interesting about it is it doesn't matter what country you're talking about, would-be authoritarians use the same tactics. They try to uh, capture the referees, replace neutral, objective officials in government, law enforcement officials, attorneys general, um, scientists, ethics officials, with people who are personally loyal to them. So that's the first part of the soccer analogy. The second is that they try to uh, knock out star players. In the soccer analogy, that means people who are prominent critics of theirs. It can include the press. And the third thing they try to do is change the rules to make things tilt more in their favor. The president has done all of these things. Um, right now, what he's doing with the executive order, I think, involves both an attempt to capture the referees. The media can be seen as a neutral observer. I think, I think you could put the social media platforms in that category as well. Um, and also to knock out star players, people who could be critics of him. So Twitter did something that was rather mild. Uh, Donald Trump called it censorship. It's not censorship. First of all, private entities can't really censor. Censorship is prohibiting speech. They don't have the ability to prohibit the president from speaking. Um, what I don't think anyone should be doing that, by the way, but they can't. Um, what they did was to moderate his comments, something that's protected by federal law, Section 230 of this 1996 law I mentioned before. And Donald Trump's response was to cite the founding fathers and say, this is the kind of censorship the framers of our constitution warned against. He has it exactly backwards, actually. What the framers of the constitution were worried about, James Madison talked about this. James Madison said, the censorial power rests not in the government over the people. The, yeah, the government can't censor people, but in the people over the government. Madison thought that the people should serve as a kind of censor over the government, not by prohibiting government speech, they can't do that, but by criticizing, by dissenting, in this, in this context, by just simply pointing out the facts. And this is really important in the context of our election because we saw in 2016, social media, social media platforms were used to spread disinformation. And it's important that p voters, in order for our democracy to work, have to get accurate information. I think Twitter was trying to do that in, in a rather limited and measured way. And the president's response was basically to say, back off and there will be consequences to you. He actually said, he said, I would shut down Twitter if I could. So I'm worried about how not just Twitter, but other social media platforms will respond to this threat. So there, Mike, but I guess you've sort of, but I think uh, more specifically, I mean, does he even have the authority to make an executive order like this or is that beyond the point? It's a good question. Uh, because it's a natural question. One thing that's confusing about dealing with would-be authoritarians is most of us, 
like constitutional democracy, we like the idea of the rule of law, of elections, of our constitution, and we expect people to play by those rules. Would-be authoritarians do not. So it gets confusing. I'm a lawyer by background. The, you know, I, I, I practiced law for about 10 years, and I'm used to thinking about things in legal terms. Um, but that's not the right way to think about authoritarians. At least it's not the only way, because authoritarians, again, they reject the idea that limits can be applied to them. So I saw some commentary in the president's executive order, and some people just said, well, this is ridiculous. He can't do this. It's, he's violating the First Amendment. He can't punish social media companies that disagree with him. That's classic viewpoint discrimination under the First Amendment. That's true. And that would apply if you were dealing with a normal president, like a President George W. Bush or Barack Obama, who were not authoritarians. Um, authoritarianism is not a partisan issue, of course. It's, you know, George W. Bush was a constitutional Democrat who was a conservative, and Barack Obama was one who was a liberal. Um, there are left-wing authoritarians and right-wing authoritarians. But when you're dealing with an authoritarian, I think it's a mistake uh, Gary Kasparov, who is a uh, the famous chess champion, but also a critic of Vladimir Putin's, has said uh, that you can't assume authoritarians will, ex by, by their nature, they won't accept legal limits. So it's true that the president can't do this in the sense that he doesn't have the authority to change the law. The executive order claims that authority. It claims that he can set policy for the United States. He can't do that. We have a government at the national level with three branches, and he can't make laws by himself. The problem, though, is authoritarians don't accept that. Authoritarians want to do what they want. And basically what authoritarians do is they say, I'm going to do this. Who's going to stop me? Our system is not self-executing. It's not automatic. So when the president issues an executive order that goes beyond the reach of his power and tries to punish social media companies, for what he perceives as criticism of him. Um, what he's doing is he's saying, I claim this authority. Who is going to stop me? And what? And I don't mean to be paranoid about this. I don't think it will necessarily work. But what concerns me is in a, full, in a functioning and healthy, healthy constitutional democracy, people from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, ought to be saying, the president cannot do this. Um, and I haven't really seen that so much. Um, I saw a Republican governor, uh, the governor of, of Maryland, um, Larry Hogan, did say, was critical, and he said, you know, the president is ratcheting things up more than he's calming them down. I think that's, that's good to say. But again, what you'd really like to see here is people on both sides, uh, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Tom Cotton, standing with Democrats, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, to say, in our system, the president doesn't set the policy for the United States. The president can't change the law. We have a system of checks and balances of separation of powers, and this executive order flies in the face of that. Um, the fact that we haven't seen that, and it's just the latest example, this has been true throughout uh, President Trump's time in office. When he does these kind of things, we don't really see a strong response from for Republicans. So I think the lesson he takes from that, and he's taken for several years, is I can do what I want, and there won't really be consequences. That's dangerous. Again, it's not, it's not catastrophic. It doesn't mean it will necessarily work, but it's not the sign of a healthy constitutional democracy. Um, I'm going to open the, the floor to questions from our audience uh, soon, but uh, before we do that, uh, one last question I have for you is, this all, in a way, what, what kind of pressure does this put on the social media companies themselves? I mean, even if this is not enforceable, even if this is not um, yes. constitutional in any way, it's still now part of the national conversation. So what, what kind exactly. of pressure and what, what's the fear? That's right. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Thanks for asking that. Mm -hmm. So if you're Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, forgive me, Jack Dorsey, yeah. Twitter, uh, the first way you're going to think about this is, is it legal? Can we challenge it in court? That costs a lot of money, it takes time. And you don't know for sure you're going to win. I and mean, I think they, they, they have a good case, but mm -hmm. nothing. Guaranteed. And again, I mentioned the, one of the authoritarian's tactics is capturing the referees. The president has spent a lot of time putting judges in position who he perceives as personally loyal to him. If he's right, that puts him in a better place to win these cases. So they can challenge him in court. Okay, it's going to cost a lot of money, and uh, they don't know for sure that they'll win. And in the meantime, the president is going to be doing things that make their life harder. He said, I will shut down Twitter if I can. Um, so I think there are two basic ways that the social media companies can, or two polar 
opposites in terms of how they can respond. One is to say, I'm just going to go along with this. That's what happened in Venezuela, for instance, when uh, Hugo Chavez, the left-wing populist in, in Venezuela in the 1990s, threatened media companies. They decided just to go along with it. Uh, television networks that broadcast news and opinion coverage started doing astrology instead. Uh, they just decided it's easier to stay out of this. We don't want to antagonize this guy. So they might decide to let the president do what he wants to, if he wants to post a comment as he did the other day to say, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, to just let that stand, whether that leads to violence or not. Or if he puts out misinformation during the election, as he did with the uh, mail-in voting comments, to just leave that alone. It's easier for us. We don't want the trouble. Mark Zuckerberg made a comment that worried me in that regard. Mark Zuckerberg said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said social media companies shouldn't be in the business of deciding what's true and what's not. That to me sounded like, oh, maybe he's just going to let the president do as he pleases. The other kind of response, which I'm seeing some signs of from Twitter, but it's hard to say for sure, is to say, to stand your ground, to say, this isn't right. The president can't push us around. We're not going to be bullied. Um, and that, you know, they can take that approach too. But I don't know for sure which way they'll respond. And the fact that lots of observers are rightly saying that this is classic First Amendment content discrimination that the president's engaging in and it violates both a statute and the constitution um, should make social media companies feel better. But I think they're also going to have to decide, is it worth the trouble for us to take this president on? And in other countries, I mentioned uh, Venezuela as one example, Russia was another. Uh, sometimes media companies decided it just wasn't worth the trouble and they went along with it. We're not there yet. We're certainly not Venezuela or Russia, but uh, we have a president who has ambitions to make the country look more like that kind of model than the constitutional democracy that the, the framers created and that's been developed over the years. So um, whether or not this is legal, I am concerned that will have an impact. And I'm especially concerned in this election season, given that the 2016 election was dominated by misinformation on social media. What if that continues to happen? I mean, it, we've seen that it is happening. Uh, will social media companies be able, will they feel empowered to be in a position to give people accurate information? I'm not sure. Um, and again, just to remind our viewers, you can you can ask your questions in the comments section in Facebook Live. Um, one more question though. It, it, so given the pressure that these companies are feeling, do you think it's gonna stifle sort of innovation in this field or maybe put people on alert at those who might be thinking about creating their own networks that, you know, there maybe that's not worth pursuing given the current um, sort of scrutiny. It's possible. It's hard to say for sure. Um, one thing I should say though is uh, the president is assigning social media companies too much significance. When he says that they're censoring speech, they can't do that. They didn't do that and they can't do that. We should be careful not to make the same mistake either. Uh, social media companies and platforms are important, of course, but there are things we can do as well. We can decide how we want to participate in these platforms and how we consume the information that's available on those platforms and what we say and what we, how we respond to this. So neither the president nor these social media platforms uh, has the final say on this discussion. However, I, I would feel better if social media platforms were committed to making sure that people get good, accurate information. And what the president's made, basically what the president is saying to them is, you have to let me say whatever I want, whether it's true or not, whether it's dangerous or not, whether it might incite violence or not. And I'm not 100% confident that social media platforms will stand up to that. They may, they may decide to go along with it. So then I, we do have a question for the audience about, oh, good. and you, you um, alluded to this earlier, but why, why do you think that more sort of constitutionally democratic Republicans, you know, the, the ones that are sort of, went to working within the system, why aren't they speaking up? It's such a great question. It's something I've thought about for the past several years. Um, of course, I can't say with certainty, um, but what I think is going on is many of these Republicans were very critical of the president when he was campaigning in 2016. Lindsey Graham, who's now a strong supporter of the president, said, if we nominate this president, we deserve to lose. And he was harshly critical of President Trump during 2016. Other Republicans were too. A number of them de declined to endorse the president. I think what happened is once he won though, they had to make a decision. Uh, do we oppose this president? Some did. Uh, Jeff Flake, senator from Arizona, Bob Corker, senator from Tennessee, uh, Mark Sanford, a congressman from South Carolina, all Republicans, they all lost their jobs. 
Sanford was primary and Flake and Corker didn't run for re-election because basically what Republicans in Congress are seeing is it's sort of like the social media platforms are seeing. If you stand up to this president, there will be consequences for you. You probably won't keep your job. Um, so I think that's the calculus a lot of them are making. Not uniformly. I mean, we saw Senator Romney voted to remove the president from office, but he's sort of a lone voice right now. So I think most of them have decided that the theory of our constitution, Madison said in the Federalist Papers, is ambition will counteract ambition. That means if one branch of the government goes too far, the others will rein them in. The problem, of course, though, is, so the idea would be if the president goes too far, Congress would take action. What Madison didn't take no account, though, is members of Congress may, may think of themselves as members of a party first. A Republican member of Congress or a Democrat in, in a different context will say, this is a president of my party. Do I really want to be crossing that president? If I want to stay in office, the best way to stay in office is be on that president's side. I think that's what's going on for the most part. Um, it doesn't have to. I guess Senator Romney is a really good example of, of diverging from that approach. And in other countries, I mentioned this book, How Democracies Die Before. The authors of that book say that the best way to protect constitutional democracy is for people in the same party as the would-be authoritarian to stand against them. And that happened, for instance, in France in 2017 and Austria in 2016. So this is not a partisan issue. Um, Republicans, and certainly many Republicans who are out of office, there's a group called the Lincoln Project, conservatives uh, who advised and worked on presidential campaigns, Steve Schmidt. Um, well, George Conway's on that, right? What's up? George Conway's there, I think. George Conway, right? The husband of one of the president's advisors, Kelly Con mm -hmm. Conway, Rick Wilson. They have formed a group called the Lincoln Project, which is basically conservatives and Republicans who think that the president is a threat to constitutional democracies. None of these are partisan issues, or they shouldn't be. But the way it's playing out is that many Republicans in Congress sort of like the social media platforms have just decided it's easier for us to go along. Is there anything that, uh, and this is another question we have, is there anything that can be done at an individual level? Like individual of course. putting pressure on representatives? Yes. Or, um, and it, will that bring any kind of consequence? These two questions are so good. I appreciate both mm -hmm. questions. Exactly right. We're not powerless. There's lots we can do. We can vote. We can be active in political campaigns for whatever candidate we think uh, is taking the right approach. We can organize. We can talk to people. There are lots of groups that are involved in this. I mentioned the Lincoln Project as one. Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals who are concerned about these issues. You can get involved in political campaigns or in political efforts. The Lincoln Project is not a political campaign, but it's a, I believe it's a PAC that's raising money. They, they put out ads about uh, the election. Um, you can talk to your friends. You can talk to your family. You can contact your elected representatives and tell them what you think. You can comment on social media. I mean, we're talking about the president sees social media as a good way to comment. We can as well. Right. Um, you can write, you can speak up. There are lots and lots of things that people can do. People are not powerless. Um, authoritarians rely on that. Authoritarians want to wear people out. They want people to just say, just like the social media platforms and Republican members of Congress, to say it's not worth it. Uh, we don't have to accept that. Just like the social media platforms, we can say we're going to stand up to this. We think constitutional democracy is worth preserving. So it's an excellent question. That's exactly the right thing to ask. There's lots and lots that people can do. And for people who are interested, contact me. I'm glad to talk about it in more detail because you know it's more that we can discuss right now, but absolutely right. So then I guess on the other side, I've got a question that said, um, isn't Twitter not just the public square, like a modern town square, a public forum? And we did see some of this on on uh, from other you know social media folks online. I think the wing, one of the Wingleboss twins said something along the lines of like, you wouldn't anticipate the post office censoring your mail or giving you disclaimers along with anything you get in your mail. Is it not Twitter? Is or is that actually overreach on Twitter's part? Yeah, I saw that comment. I think he said something like, you know, the post office couldn't do anything to your mail or the phone company to your call. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. When I send a letter, I don't make it public. When I call somebody, I don't make it public. Mm -hmm. When you post on social media platforms, it's public by its nature. That's how it works. Now, that does mean that these platforms are important. It doesn't mean that they should have, that's the whole point of section 230 of this law I mentioned before. They shouldn't have to simply serve as a bulletin board where they post things without comment. I mentioned before, the president said the other day, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter responded to that as well. I think the flag they put on that comment was to say, this glorifies violence. 
from my point of view, and I think many people, if they hadn't done that, that would be a mistake. That, he said the other night, uh, Saturday night, there was a, there's been protests and unrest in Washington, D.C., including near the White House. And he said on Saturday on Twitter, tonight is MAGA night. Mm-hmm. That was, I think many people understood that as an invitation for his supporters to come to the White House. If he said MAGA night at the White House, that's sort of an invitation to silence. Social media platforms do have a responsibility, and many Democrats are actually critical of them. On the other side, Donald Trump is saying, you're, you're clamping down too hard. You shouldn't be commenting my post. Democrats are saying, you're not doing enough. When politicians, and by the way, of course, Democrats can do this too. It's not limited to Donald Trump or other Republicans. Anyone could do this. When any elected official says something that's wrong, that's potentially dangerous, that could incite violence, I would argue social media platforms have a responsibility to do something just as they would for ordinary users. When ordinary users do something like that, they understand their, their accounts can be blocked, suspended, even deleted. Uh, politicians are in a different place than, than other people, but they shouldn't be immune from these standards. Twitter was trying to do something rather mild. I think, uh, I think it's fair to, to, to ask whether they should actually be doing more. So yes, yeah, social media platforms are important, but if the social media platforms can't make sure that people get good information, they will be failing. We know in 2016, people got misinformation. Russia attacked social media. They created false accounts and asked people to meet up at events that they thought were American political rallies that were actually organized by Russian operatives. Um, when, When social media knows that this is going on, when they know there's misinformation, whoever it comes from, President Trump, uh, somebody just a regular Twitter user, somebody who's posing as a regular Twitter user. I think it's their responsibility. And that's again, what section 230 of this law was designed to provide. They have the tools, they have the legal tools to to flag these posts, to moderate them. They should do it. When they're not doing that, that's a problem. And they actually may face regulation on the other side from people who do have legal authority to regulate them. Congress, who may say, wait a second, if we've given you these tools, if you're protected from lawsuits, you better be doing this responsibly. You can't let bad information, dangerous information go unchallenged on your platforms. So then I guess this is a good question that you mentioned Congress. I think this is a great question for us to end on, but this kind of tussle, this this, this conflict between Trump and social media platforms and, and this executive order, is it the kind of catalyst that maybe would be needed for maybe Congress to come in and and, uh, and have a response and say, listen, we need to make presidential powers more clear that there's been a lot of sort of murkiness around what executive power is lately. And we need to actually come in and finally clarify this. Because in, in some ways you could argue, Congress is being absolutely sidestepped on, on, on many, many issues. And so is this, is this finally the, the catalyst that's needed? Another really good question. This is something I think about a lot. From my point of view, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, to say the least, I'm somebody who's studied American history my whole life. I have strong feelings about the Constitution. The framework were not perfect. They got a lot of things right, and the Constitution's improved over the years. My sad conclusion is that our constitutional system has failed. I think it needs uh, really dramatic reform. I think the principles are right. Liberal democracy, constitutional democracy, is worth preserving. Free and fair elections, individual rights, um, equality for people without regard to race, gender or sexual orientation. Uh, these are principles that can be protected by a constitution and, and really in many ways are on paper. But James Madison said the constitution that parchment barriers are not enough. And what we have written on paper right now is not working, it's not doing the job. Members of Congress have all the tools they need to set limits on presidential power. And this, I wrote a book about President Obama arguing that he had overreached, that he had gone beyond his constitutional authority, especially when it came to using military force. Uh, Members of Congress didn't take action to set limits in his power. They haven't taken actions, and it raises different concerns because of President Trump's authoritarian tendencies. They haven't taken actions for this president. So, yes, I think the final conclusion is that this system is not working. We need to change it. We need to do, we need to think about how do we, if Madison's idea that ambition should counteract ambition is not working, how do we come up with a system that will better achieve his goal? Madison said the separation of powers is designed to prevent any one branch of government for having too much power. He said the accumulation of too much power in any one branch is the definition of tyranny. I think he's right about that. And I think that should be our goal. But I think the system we have right 
right now is not allowing us to achieve that goal. So I think we need to think long and hard about how we can change the system to, to make, nothing's guaranteed by the way, mm -hmm. the best, you know, best system on paper that we can imagine, we can make all the changes we want. It all comes down to people taking action. Um, so we have to think about how do we put people in the best position to take action? If members of Congress will hesitate to take on presidents or their own party, maybe we need something else. Maybe we need independent agencies. Maybe the Department of Justice needs to be independent. These are just you know, speculative ideas, but I think we need to think about how, maybe, the, maybe the system needs to be more democratic. Right now, one can win elections without winning popular votes. And for president, um, the Senate, one party can control the Senate without having majority support um, in the country and the house, house districts, of course, that's a problem too. So I think we need to think seriously about how to change the system. This is not, not something to be done lightly. It's very serious. It's um, it should be done carefully and cautiously and judiciously. But yes, I think we need to find a way to put ourselves in a better position to achieve the goals that Madison en envisioned. Well, I, I think this is a conversation that we're gonna be having for a while. I mean, at least yes. in the election. And I appreciate, Chris, your time today, uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, for those of you that joined us on Facebook, thank you very much for your time. Um, we will continue this conversation, like I said, as much as possible. Please stay tuned for more communications from us as the, as the summer goes on. But Chris, uh, again, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna end it here. Um, please leave your questions in the comment section though. Um, and uh, please reach out if you have any more. Uh, as Chris said, this is something that yes. is very, um, very sort of compelling over the course of the summer. Oh, I'm very glad to talk about this. Thanks for the great questions from you and from everyone. Really excellent points. Okay, thanks everybody.